So let's, why don't we move into the subjective results? Yeah. So, I mean, I think there were a number of things that stood out to me. And obviously I'm just going to mainly talk about the week of the actual fast. I think the, the bread, so to speak, on the nothing burger is not that interesting. So the first thing that interested me, I, I, I only had one concern going into this week of fasting which was every time I do those five-day FMDs, sleep just drives me nuts. I hate going to bed so hungry. And when you're like eating 750 calories a day, you're generally going to bed hungry, and I generally find it quite miserable. So that's the one thing that kind of was a bit of a, I was kind of dreading. I was like, you know, I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to be working my ass off. And I don't like the idea that every night I'm going to lay in bed staring at the ceiling for 10 hours, starving, wishing I could eat the sheets. And even though I didn't think it would last the whole week, because I knew at some point the ketones would sort of kick in, even just having to do that for two or three nights was was a little unpleasant to me. And yet immediately from the very first night, that Sunday night, and I was hungry because I hadn't eaten all day. I mean, I slept like a champ. There, there was just such an improvement in my sleep, not in the duration. Actually, I generally sleep a little bit shorter when I'm in New York. Part, part of it's the jet lag, but part of it's just the noise and the stimulation and that I'm a lot busier. But I woke up the next morning and I was like, I felt like, I felt like I'd slept 10 hours, even though I'd probably slept, I'd have to go back and look, but it might've been six and a half or something like that or seven. But my stage three, stage four numbers, which are typically the lowest numbers were surprisingly high, um, to about two to three X what they normally are. And that just continued without exception for that entire week. And it abated the second I refed. So, I mean, we can explore that a little bit more, but that was sort of the most surprising, quasi-subjective, quasi-objective finding. Uh, I think the second thing that really kind of uh, surprised me was um, how strong I felt when I was lifting weights. So I did not experience any deterioration of strength. And it it actually got a little bit better. By the end of the week, that Friday, which was day six, which was a squat row press day, that's a very heavy day. I mean, I felt like a beast. Now I was lightheaded every time I would finish a set, especially squatting. I thought I was gonna fall over. And I think I held off a little bit, I probably, stayed about 20 pounds below maybe where I would have gone otherwise on that day. But I mean, absolutely no deterioration of strength whatsoever. Conversely, I felt, felt impossible to move my legs quickly. So walking felt super unpleasant. On day three or four, I went for a walk in the park with a friend of mine and we were going to walk the loop of the park, which is about five or six miles. And halfway through, he could just see how much I was dragging my ass. And he's like, dude, let's just, let's just cut across here and cut it short. And I was, I didn't argue. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> also riding the Peloton was super painful. Just couldn't generate the cadence. Couldn't keep the cadence above 90, you know, in the 90 to 100 zone where I would normally like to be. And actually it's funny. I'm embarrassed to say this, but on that Friday, the day six, after I finished having a great workout of squats and, you know, rows and all of these, you know, heavy compound movements, I, the thought of walking the mile home from the crunch to my apartment was so unbearable. Even though it was a perfectly nice day, I took a taxi, never done that before in my life. (laughs) Just, I was like, there's no goddamn way I'm walking home. Like it'll take a day is what I thought. And walking upstairs, super uncomfortable. Not, and, and again, I don't mean uncomfortable like it hurt the muscle. I mean, I don't know what I mean. Just there's some level of uncomfort that was there that drove me nuts. The final really, really interesting, actually there were two other interesting things. One of them was, I talked about how I came into this with a really good meditative routine, but that week it went to another level. Uh, so I meditated in a way I've never meditated before. And normally when I'm walking around the street, I always have headphones on and I'm always doing something. I'm either listening to a podcast, listening to an audiobook, listening to music or talking on the phone. In other words, I am never just walking around spacing out or taking in the ambient sound. For some reason on that week, I pretty much always, I'd walk out of my building or walk out of the office or walk out of wherever I was leaving. And I wouldn't even remember to put my headphones in. And I would just walk and I would just look at stuff and 
you know, be as present and mindful as any human could be and not even kind of realize it was happening until 20 minutes later when I'd be like, geez, I haven't even like made a phone call or checked my phone or done any of these other things. So, so that to me kind of fit hand in hand with how I felt during the meditation, which was just a, a very unique sense of calmness that, that was, that is quite uncommon for me. I think the, you know, final sort of subjective, interesting surprise was in December of 2016, I hurt my right wrist moving a bunch of dumb, heavy stuff, like totally not a good excuse to hurt yourself. And about six, about a year ago, the summer, last summer, I hurt my left elbow. So I've got this left elbow thing that's kind of nagging me and this right wrist thing that's nagging me. And they're kind of, if I'm, if I'm deadlifting heavy, I need to wrap them in a certain way. And if I, you know, it's just, they, they just, I'd been constantly giving attention to these things, sort of constantly getting, you know, Josh working on them and we'd made, we'd made progress, but I mean, I still felt, you know, significant pain, especially in the, uh, elbow. And at the end of that whole experiment, so it's hard to know how much of it was ketosis, fasting ketosis, but I would just venture to guess that the fasting played the biggest role. Even now, how many weeks out we are from this, the right wrist pain is 100% gone. Uh, I mean, I I can't even remember what it felt like now, which is odd for something that um, ailed me for so long. And the left elbow pain is almost gone. Uh, And it's to the point where I don't have to even put a wrap on it when I'm holding the bow. So one area where I really suffered was holding the bow when I was arching. Arching, is that even a word? Doing archery. So if I'm holding it out with my left arm, just the pain in the left elbow became kind of my rate limiting step on shooting. And that's completely gone. So I don't know. If nothing else, the whole thing was worth it just for that. Hmm. Do you have any speculation as to why, sort of the whys behind feeling this calmness and the maybe being more present while fasting? Oh, I was hoping you would. <laughs> I have no goddamn idea. What do you think? So, I, I mean, I did a fast. I did a seven-day fast maybe a year ago. And I noticed that as well, that I'm usually not, let's say, present or in the moment. And I felt that. I'm not a very religious person, but I it felt almost like a, if what a religious experience might feel like. And I know that a lot of religions do fasting. If I were to wildly speculate... Part of it, I think, is you think about alertness, just awareness and alertness, and you think it's going to go in the tank if I'm not eating, I'm lethargic, I've missed all of my meals the last four or five days, and then I think, well, maybe from an evolutionary perspective that you you can get a heightened sense of awareness because if there's something to be killed or picked out of the ground or something like that, you may need to hop on that opportunity. So you may need to have this heightened sense of awareness. And I don't know if that carries over to cognition. And then I kind of, I thought about, you know, the low and slow exercise that you were doing where it's not very, you know, fight or flight necessarily, even though you're going up like say a flight of stairs and it's, it's taxing. Like it feels taxing when it shouldn't feel taxing. It never has in your life really. But the sort of fight or flight, deadlifting, squatting, doing something that, you know, high intensity sounds almost counterintuitive, but again, it kind of goes to this heightened sense of awareness or readiness. And it might sound counterintuitive that you've had four or five days of fasting, but it's really like you, you may, from an evolutionary perspective, you may really need to seize that opportunity. And I don't know if those two things square with this idea of having this awareness, have it like, you know, I don't know if you guys talked about it, you and Tim Ferriss with psychedelics, for example, when you you talk about like appreciating things, particularly nature, where you're just more aware of those things. And I don't know if with fasting, if there's some relationship to that, that you're just, you have this heightened sense of awareness and you become more sort of conscious of your surroundings. Don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. And it's it's a really interesting idea. And I, I know Tim actually did a fasting meditative silent retreat. So he did a Vipassana retreat for seven or 10 days. I think it was seven days. And he also fasted during that period of time. So again, I'm curious as to how that experience compared to Vipassana retreats he has done where he has not fasted. 
and to experiences where he's fasted and not done the meditative retreat. I also wonder how much of a common element or elements are consistent between the experience I had with sleep and this state that you're describing. Because I, again, that that whole sleep thing has really made me question this, you know, addiction I have to the societal norm of making dinner the social meal. You know, when I, if you look at Sachin Panda's work and we were all laboratory animals, we really ought to be eating first thing in the morning and then tapering off later in the day. If we're really going to follow both our circadian rhythm, but also optimize around glucose disposal and insulin sensitivity. So why don't we do that, right? Or why don't I do that? Why do I generally not eat in the morning and then backload it? And it's all social, right? It's like, I'm not going to have breakfast with everybody, but I'm going to have dinner with everybody. But of course, I have to wonder how much of that experience due to the, not just the ketones, because I don't, I don't think it was just the ketones, because I had this experience even on the first night when my ketones were probably like one, one and a half millimolar, which is very easy to attain during nutri- nutritional ketosis. But it was some combination of the ketones and or the complete and utter lack of digestive process. And that's made me think maybe I should just be getting up eating the biggest breakfast in the world, and then not eat the rest of the day. Could I pull that off? And I, I just, I've been too lazy to try, frankly. But that sleep, like, that shit was awesome. <laughs> like, I, I want that. I want that every goddamn night. Because, like, you could do anything. I feel like there's no end to the type of regeneration you could have with, with what I was experiencing there. So anyway, that's that's probably my best hypothesis on that. I think the last point, I kind of forgot to make it earlier because we haven't alluded to it. Again, if you look at the pictures, apologizing for the fact that I'm posting dorky, goofy selfies, I honestly didn't feel like I lost any muscle mass. I obviously lost a little bit. If you're going to lose 12 pounds, my guess is I lost a pound or two of muscle, probably five, six pounds of fat, and the rest of it would have been water mass, both mass with like glycogen loss in the muscle. So every gram of glycogen you lose, you're losing three or four grams of water that go with it. Some reduction in plasma volume as well. So again, we didn't talk much about that, but I, I couldn't believe I didn't lose more muscle mass. Like I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but at the end I was like, oh, I kind of think I look better now than I've ever looked. And you would normally think after a fast, you'd be a little kind of decrepit looking. I certainly looked better than I looked, I think, going into this experience, uh, which is not to say I look good going into it because I'm sort of not at my, what I would consider ideal leanness or anything, but that was a, that was a pleasant surprise. And, and again, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't using even a, even a gram of branch chain amino acids during that fasted uh, week of working out. So at some point that's going to change, you know, if I did a 10 day fast, a 14 day fast, at some point I expect that would change dramatically. But it was interesting to see that even seven days of not fasting, I don't think it cost me any measurable amount of lean tissue.